remember that uh, the favor was there. That's a roundabout way to introducing our speaker, but it was 40 years ago, probably this month or next, I was stationed at Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio working as a career counselor. And one afternoon, one of the fellows in my section, who was also a member of the church, and I can't remember his name, I can't hardly remember what he looked like, but he uh, suggested to me that we go to some young people's rally. They weren't called rallies, and uh, so far back I forgot what we called them, but the youth gathering of, of, of some sort. And he suggested that we go together, and uh, I said, well, why? He said, well, some sergeant's going to speak at it. And as a PFC, I didn't know if I wanted to hear a sergeant in church or not. <laughs> but uh, I figured, well, I may as well go see what a sergeant's like if he's, if he's trying to preach, not expecting too much. And when I got there, the uh, sergeant was too tall and skinny to really be an Air Force sergeant, but I discovered that he could really preach. And uh, I remember going home that night and writing a letter to my folks that I just heard a sergeant, who to me was previously unknown, but who obviously was one of the finest uh, preachers in the church today, I still don't know who it was that prevailed upon me to uh, go to that youth gathering that night, but for 40 years I've been grateful because that was the beginning of an appreciation for a man that I consider to be one of the truly outstanding uh, preachers of my generation, but beyond that, one that, that's been a group of, of many of you. I've had the privilege of being with him in meetings, lectureships, uh, having him in hours, and I've seen him in times where uh, he was the object of completely unjustified criticism, and I suspect I've seen him in times when he was not the object, but should have been of justified criticism. <laughs> but, uh, you know, a narrow target is hard to hit, so... <laughs> But uh, it's been a, a rich association for me, and frankly, if we had never got to be personal friends, I would still have uh, considered it a genuine privilege to uh, be able to listen to him preach, to uh, read the material that he's written, but more than that, to know the sort of man that he is, uh, particularly in times of adversity, in times of... of, of difficulties that probably seem undeserved, but also in times where, most especially, he has the opportunity to share a message about which he has, now that's a longer introduction you wanted, but much shorter than I wanted, uh, but uh, I'm sure that many of you could have, uh, who have known Roy over the years, uh, would have liked to have had the privilege of this introduction. We'll be singing number 276. Uh, following that, uh, Roy Osborne will be speaking. And um, I told him that there's no concert after the uh, lectureship tonight, so he could go five minutes over. And uh, if he does, don't worry about it. He actually had permission.
pillage and, and then slip back across the border before they could catch him. And he did this for a long time. And finally one day he was sitting in a bar in South Texas and a Texas ranger spotted him and slipped up behind him and put his 44 at his temple and said, Juan Pedro Gonzalez, if you do not tell me where you have hidden all the gold that you have stolen, I'm going to blow your brains out. And by that time, the bar has emptied of patrons. They are all gone. The problem is that Pedro Gonzalez does not speak a word of English, so we have a problem. But there's a little kid lying down looking under the swinging doors of the saloon, and he says, Senor Ranger, Pedro Gonzalez does not speak English. Would you like for me to tell him what you said? The ranger said, yeah, tell him. The kid says, Pedro Gonzalez, the ranger says, if you do not tell him who you... Pedro Gonzalez said, tell him if he will go to the well in the center of the city and count down five bricks from the top, there is a loose brick. And behind that brick, he will find all the gold that I've hidden. The kid said, Senor Ranger, Pedro Gonzalez says he is a very brave man. He is not afraid to die. You may shoot him any time you want to. <laughs> The moral to this story is, you better be careful who does your translating for you. <laughs> and that's a more serious moral than you might think. I think it is very important for all of us to ask ourselves who does our translating for us. Who interprets life for you? Who interprets right and wrong for you? Who tells you what is proper and what is improper? Who do you look to to set the standards and the priorities of your life? Where do you go for a touchstone, for a standard? The cornerstone of a building, they were talking about the stone that was at the corner. I found out later on that that is not true. My son is a builder, and he says, no, Dad. He said, the cornerstone is not necessarily at the corner. He said, the cornerstone is that point that they measure everything from. It's that place that decides what is up and what is down and what is right and what is left and how far it is supposed to be. Where is your cornerstone? Who interprets life for you? Who is the standard that you look to? We've just gone through a very embarrassing period of time in this country of ours in which the Senate and the Congress of the United States of America decided to investigate the life of an individual who was about to be appointed to the Supreme Court. Why go to all that trouble? Why have all of these hearings, and I'm not talking about the sexual harassment part, but the first part. Why go to all that trouble? Perhaps because this man was going to be invested with the power to interpret the Constitution of the United States. I think one of the problems that we've had over the years is that we have given to men who really were not prepared to do so for us when we should have kept the responsibility for ourselves. We have depended too long on big preachers, on editorocracy, on others to tell us what to believe, what the interpretation is when God gave us that responsibility. Who does your interpreting for you? We've just sung, Jesus is all the world to me. Does he do your interpreting for you? Is he the standard of your life? Is he really? What Jesus are you talking about? Are you talking about the one that I believe in, or are you talking about the one that is believed in by the man down the street? How do you know? Have you discovered him for yourself? Do you know who this Jesus is? Is his story your story? As our or have you borrowed it from somebody else? I said to my you, is read the words and remember what somebody else has said about them. Don't we? Don't we? What we heard a Sunday school teacher say. Or what we discussed. I wonder how many man hours we have wasted in Sunday school arguing about whether we can be perfect or not. Know anybody has got the answer to that? 
It's, it's a silly argument. It's a semantic argument, you know. If you're talking about whether we can behave perfectly, the answer is absolutely not. But if you're talking about whether we can be perfect by condition, the answer is absolutely yes, through Jesus Christ our Lord. See? You can be perfect. In fact, he said so. Be ye perfect, even as my heavenly Father is perfect. And he didn't tell me to do anything that's impossible. But the only way I can be perfect if I ever achieve that, that ultimate goal of perfection except by giving up to Jesus Christ. Here's your standard. I got a letter the other day. And in this letter she said, how do you retrieve a fading faith? Any of you have that problem? How do you retrieve a fading faith? And then she went on to tell me what her problem was. She said, so many years I've had so many problems and I've prayed so many prayers and none of them have been answered. And she said something very unsettling. She said, I trust you and I want you to give me the answer. For you, lady. <laughs> Don't let it be me. Don't let it be me. But you see, the Jesus that she believed in was a Jesus that fixed things. Is that the one you believe in? Is the Jesus you're looking to as the standard of your life and the one to answer the questions for you, is he the one that fixes things? Is he the one that's promised to balance your checking account and make sure that you don't get the epizootic and nothing happens to you? There are a lot of people that believe that, you know. He says, pray and I'll give you everything. And they feel like that he's sort of a cosmic bellhop that whatever you ask for, he'll give to you. He never promised that, never. As a matter of fact, the great comfort in being with Jesus Christ is not that everything is going to be fine, but the privilege of being on his staff is the comfort. If you're in the army, they never promised you that you would never have to be in a foxhole. They never promised you that you would never have problems in Babel. But what a privilege to be on the staff. That's the way we ought to look at Jesus Christ. He has not promised you that all will be easy. He has not promised you that you will not die, that you will not get sick, that you will not be poor, that then that offers those things we're doomed to disappointment. And if that Jesus is all the world to you, your world is destined to come crashing down around you. It won't work. It won't work. Who does your interpreting for you? A Jesus that doesn't exist? Or someone who offers to you a Jesus who is nothing but a judge? Who does your interpreting for you? One of the problems that this lady had in her fading faith was that she had placed her key for her, and he never promised that he would do that. I taught in Czechoslovakia this last summer, and in my class I was teaching English to Czechoslovakians using the Bible as a textbook. It's an exciting experience. And in my class I had the head of the Czechoslovak parachute team, Emil Franjic. And when he came into my class, he said that my mother and father were both members of the Communist Party. And therefore, I never saw a Bible until I was married, and that was just a couple of years ago, and I've never read it at all. So who does his interpreting for him? He said, as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it. Paul says, Timothy, they can do the interpreting for you because you know where they learned it. You know where they came from. Emil Franjic does not have that privilege. <coughs> Who does your interpreting for you? Are you going to trust your family to do your interpreting for you? How are you going to find Jesus Christ? I suggest that the only thing that you can do is to find him for yourself. Too long have we turned over to others the responsibility for telling us what we're supposed to believe, who God is, and who Jesus Christ is. The preacher does not know Jesus Christ for you. He cannot. There is no way some are on semantics. And words are such weak things. I said, try to tell somebody sometime what an avocado tastes like to you. It's sort of green. Green's not a taste. That's a color, you know. Well, it tastes a little slick. Slick is not a taste. That's a feel. You know, how do you tell somebody what an avocado tastes like? The only way that they can know is to cut off a slice of it and know whether they're tasting the same thing that you do or not. 
I give somebody, you know, I think avocados are wonderful. You know, we make guacamole out of them in Texas. But I think they're just wonderful, you know. And I, I'm telling my friend about it, and he doesn't know anything about avocados, and I cut off a thing I ever saw. <laughs> and then I begin to ask questions about his intelligence, you see, because I assume that anybody that doesn't like avocados has got to be crazy. There's something wrong with them, you see. Who interprets life for you? Who finds Jesus for you? Whose story are you following? Is his story really your story, or is it somebody else's? I think it's very important that we take upon ourselves the responsibility of discovering who Jesus Christ is. And in that discovery, the quest is wonderful. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I tell you that our ultimate destiny is, fi is to find him from whom all blessings flow. Your source, and that source is God himself, and you can only find him through Jesus Christ. And if you do not make his story your story, then the way to God is obscured, and you cannot find it without him. The Apostle Paul said, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of Jesus Christ. Cross. It's going to be one of the one of the really major contributions to our literature in, in this century. Because he realized the importance of the preaching of the cross of Jesus Christ. Do you? If you do not know about the cross of Jesus Christ, then you do not know Jesus' cross. There is a passage of scripture I want to read to you tonight. It's found over in the second chapter of the book of Colossians in verse 15. The Apostle Paul is speaking about the cross. If you have never sat down to look and be amazed by this verse, you ought to. Paul says something that is absolutely impossible and incredible in these few words. Having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Tony this morning, Christ, and how the soldiers had blindfolded Jesus, and therefore he could not fend off the blows that they rained upon him, and how they spit on him, and how they mocked him, and how they made him a spectacle. Paul, weren't you there? Paul, haven't they told you the story? Paul, are you not aware of what really happened at the cross? What do you mean telling me having disarmed the powers and authorities? The Roman soldiers still had their swords when he died on the cross. He did not take away any of their weapons. He did not lower their shields. He did not snatch the whips out of their hands. What do you mean he disarmed them? He made a public spectacle of them. He was the one they spit on. He was the one with the vinegar. He was the one with the crown of thorns. He was the one they jeered and laughed at. What do you mean he made a public spectacle of them? How can you say that? And triumphed over them by the cross. He died on the cross. What do you mean he triumphed over them by the cross? But you see, Paul knew what he was talking about. Paul knew what he was talking about. Because you see... Everything that they did to him did not change him. With all of their hatred and all their vituperation and everything that they did, Jesus Christ remained the loving Lord, still able to mouth those words through tortured lips, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What is the triumph of the cross? It was not the triumph over the armies of Rome or even the powers of Judaism. It was not a triumph over Herod or Caesar or Pilate. It was not a triumph over some earthly power. It was not designed to put him upon some earthly throne. It was a triumph over the ultimate master of the earth, the devil himself. It was a triumph over sin. You see, we have centered on the resurrection. Oh, we love the resurrection. We Americans love to win, don't we? 
We love to say, we told you so, you couldn't keep him in the grave. Three days later, he came forth. We're fond of talking about the resurrection because that's when we won. That's when he came forth from the grave. That's when he showed everyone that they could not overcome him. But that's incidental. Surprise? Because you see, the resurrection was only victory over death. The problem was not death. The problem was sin. And the cross was the victory over sin. See? The resurrection was the victory over death. But the problem was sin. And the cross was the victory over sin. It was the death on the cross that paid the price. That's when he made a public spectacle of them because all that they did could not prevent him from emerging victorious over sin. No matter what they were able to do, their arms were ineffective. He disarmed them because their arms could not defeat the purposes for which he came. And the purpose for which he came was to defeat sin and its consequences. The resurrection was the glorious proclamation that it had been done. It was the wonderful realization that it was truly finished, that the battle had been won. But the true victory was on the cross. That's where we won. That's where we won. And when you come to know Jesus Christ of the cross, when you come to know him, and make his story on the cross your story. Then you're victors. Then you can walk as princes in the household of the king. And not until. It is important for us, I think, to realize mechanics. And yet we have made it that. We have spent a great deal of time arguing about how we're supposed to do things from the communion to the song service to the odd infinitums. The fact is that we have a different kind of religion from that. And until we discover that in Jesus Christ, then we're following the wrong light. In the Hebrew letter in the 8th chapter and again in, in chapter 10, the writer of Hebrews, quoting from Jeremiah, tells us that God promised that he was going to give us a different kind of covenant from the old covenant. Now the old covenant was like this. God said, if you keep my laws, I'll be your God. You don't keep my laws, I won't be your God. Simple. It was a straight out contract. You keep my laws, then I'll protect you. You don't keep my laws, you're going to be in trouble. And they didn't keep his laws, and so they went into bondage. They had famine. They had all kinds of problems. God departed from them because they broke the contract. And he said it was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. The schoolmaster was not necessarily a teacher, it was a disciplinarian. That was the individual who grabbed you by the ear, made you sit down and listen while you were being taught. The old law taught us that there was no way we could win on our own. There was no way we could live up to our potential as children of God. There was no way we could be fulfilled in this world or the next by our own efforts. We had to depend upon him. And so he says, I'm going to give you a new covenant. It's not going to be like the old one. It's not going to be a 50-50 proposition. I'm going to take it all myself, and I'm going to put my laws in your heart and write them on your mind. If your religion is one that you can quote to me in favorite passages of Scripture, it's not enough. If your religion is one that is confined to what happens within the four walls of this church building, it is not enough. If your religion is one, I care not how strict it may be in morality and in ethics and in theology. I don't care how strict you are. If it's a religion that you can write in lists and tack onto the front of your refrigerator, it's not enough. I've been accused, as Bill alluded a moment ago, to being a liberal. That, uh, you know, in religious language is the same as being an SLB in some other language. But that's what they mean by it. It means exactly the same thing when you're called this by, by people who just don't like you. Let me tell you something. If I'm a liberal, then may we all be that. 
because I do not believe in a religion that is confined to what I can quote. I want to have a religion that is so powerful that it exudes from within you from every pore because He lives in here, because He has written it on your heart and your mind, because that's the way you think, not because that's what you've been ordered to do, because you're a reflection of Him from whom all blessings flow, and it becomes intuitive for you to walk the pathway that He wants you to walk when you don't have to look up the Scripture to know whether I ought to behave this way or not. We will never cure our sociological problems in this life by making new rules, only by changing people. When their hearts are different, that I have discovered since I've been here, is the student body. Every time I see one of these students, whether they're singing here on the platform, making announcements, or whether I just meet them on a path with their bright faces and their, their cheery greetings, you know, they exude the fact that there's something different here. I spent a lot of time on college campuses in various places. But this is different. What is different about it? Is it in any of those things? It doesn't even have anything to do with what you Bible professors teach them. I'm sorry about that, fellas. It doesn't even have anything to do with that. What it really has to do with is that somewhere along the line they have picked up an intangible thing that sort of arises from within. And they find themselves different people here and there and yonder. And he somehow has gotten into them when his law is written on your minds and when it is put in your heart. It doesn't have to be written into a creed. It doesn't have to be listed on a list of laws and rules. But you will be different. And if you're only different because of the things you do when you come in this building, then it's not worth a snap. And if that be liberalism, may we all be liberal. It's time we got away from a mechanistic religion and became from the heart out what Jesus Christ really wants us to be. Amen. Then and then alone will his story be your story. can't be your story because you memorized it and can repeat it back to somebody else and tell them what the chapter and verse is. It has to be your story because it becomes so much a part of you that that's the way you behave. I saw a little boy not long ago walking along. He had the funniest walk I've ever seen. He looked like a cripple. Nothing wrong with it. It's just he walked peculiar, that's all. And I wondered what in the world, how in the world did he get like that until I met his father. <laughs> he walked exactly the same way. He just looked like a bigger crippled duck than the little boy. That's all. How do you suppose he set him down one day and says, now this is the way you're supposed to walk. He had watched his father walk so long that it became an imitated part and was built into his whole muscle structure so that he walked exactly the same way that his father did. Let me tell you something. God does not expect to sit down and tell you, now this is the way you walk when you run into this problem and this is what you do when you run into this problem. Huh? Huh. He expects you to get to where you know him so well that it's an automatic part of your life to behave the way Jesus Christ behaved. That's what it is to know him. That's how you make his story your story. That's how Jesus becomes all the world to you. But in Ephesians 2, the Apostle Paul says, By grace are you saved through faith. Not of yourselves is the gift of God. He's trying to tell us that we have to depend on him. That we have to look to him. You know, when my youngest son was very small, Nowadays, he's, he's a 30-year-old lawyer. He gets embarrassed when I tell these stories about him. He's almost getting old enough where he's no longer embarrassed by it. But, you know, you have to pass that age. But he would come to me and say, let's write Barry's name. <laughs> when he was very small, you know. Let's write Barry's name. And so we'd sit down, and I'd put the pencil in his hand, and I'd take his hand in mine. And as long as he let me do it, we got along pretty good. But when he started trying to help, we made a mess. Because he didn't know how to write his name. Brother Keeble used to tell a story. He said he went out. He was a city boy. Brother Keeble was raised in Nashville in the city. And he said he went out to a country church one time to preach. And, and when the sermon was over, why, he was, family came to him and said, you're supposed to go home with us. He said, all right. 
They took him outside, said all the buckboards were gone, and went in wagons around it, just two horses standing out. I thought, oh my goodness. <laughs> they said, well, now you're going to ride this one, and we're going to ride this one up here. Whew. So they put him on, they said, they finally got me and my hat and my Bible all on the horse at the same time, and we started out. Said, I was holding on for dear life. In a few minutes, I ran into an overhanging limb. It knocked my hat off. I dropped my Bible. I said, hey, wait a minute. And they came back. So they picked up my Bible, put it back under my arm, put my hat back on my head, took the reins out of my hand, and laid them over on the horse's neck. Said, now, Brother Keeble, said, this old mare has been going back and forth to our farm for many years. If you let her alone, she'll take you home. You start trying to guide, you're going to be in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget him telling that story. And, and you know, he said, you got to let God do it. you got to believe in Jesus Christ and let him be the guide. If you don't, it's not going to work. Let me tell you something. I want to say this. I hope I can say this so that it's clearly heard and understood. We have been so afraid to teach faith salvation because we've been in a running argument with the Baptists for so many years as to whether you're saved by faith or not that we have almost backed off from it as if we were afraid of faith. Brother Casey Mosier was the one that reminded me of this and I want to pass it on to you. Faith is not just a motivator. We have looked upon faith as being just something that motivates us to obey, right? It's a part of the five-finger exercise. It's faith, hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized. See, I remember. <laughs> faith is the motivator for the next step. Faith is the thing that's supposed to make us repent. Faith is the thing that's supposed to motivate us uh, to be baptized. Faith is the same thing that's supposed to make us come to church. It's supposed to make us give more. It's supposed to make us sing louder. It's supposed to do all of those things. Let me tell you something. Faith is not just a motivator. It does all of that. But faith is a power in its own right. It has value in and of itself to the Father. The faith you have in God is the tube through which His grace is you saved through faith. It is that faith that is the relationship you have with God over and above and beyond all the things that you do. Don't just cast it off to one side as a step along the way or a motivator to make you do something. Children. So to have faith in me is very important. Whether it makes them behave at my house or not is beside the point. I loved the time when they were small that they came to me feeling that I could fix anything. I love it when my grandson, who is now 23 years old, calls up and says, Granddaddy, can I come over? i got something I want to ask you. I said, No, I'm too busy. I'm sorry I can't talk to you today. <laughs> I'm in a pig's eye. <laughs> No, sir. I'm going to make time for him to come. Man, that's all the world. You think if I feel that way, how is God going to feel about me? It is important to God. You know, the book of Job is an interesting book. Job, of course, you know, got into all sorts of problems, and he was just, it's because you've been a bad boy, Job. He said, no, that's not true. Oh, yes, it is. He said, no, it's not. Because if that was the reason for all my trouble, look at that guy sitting up on the hill over there. He's worse than I am, and he's still getting along fine. So that ain't the answer. And finally, he got so frustrated that he said, I would order my case before Jehovah. And then it scared the tar out of him because he said, if I was standing there, I'd be scared to death. But God heard him. And God said, who is this that fills his mouth with words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will inquire of thee and see if you can answer. He asked him 40 questions. Job couldn't answer a single one. Dumbfounded, he stood before God without an answer to any. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Do you know anything about the morning stars singing together? Do you know anything about the leviathans of the deep? On and on and on he asked him questions, and Job could not answer any of them. But the most amazing part of the story to me is that at the end of the examination, God didn't give him any answers. He didn't answer a single question for Job. What does this say? I don't need you to understand me. I don't need you to explain me. I don't even need you to understand life or to be able to solve the problems of this confusing world. I don't need you smart, Job. I just need you to have faith in me. That's all. 
What a staggering picture here on this globe called the earth that it should be important to him from whom all blessings flow that I should have faith in him. Incredible. Doesn't make any sense to me. And it doesn't make any sense to a lot of people. And that's the reason we've sort of relegated it off to one side as a kind of incidental part of our theology. But let me tell you something. The key to the whole thing is the faith we have in God because it is important to Him for you to have faith in Him whether you understand it or not. Doesn't matter. Because your faith and confidence in Him is what He calls love. It's what He calls love. And it is through that tube of faith that all of His blessings and grace flow into your heart. And don't you depreciate it as being just a stepping stone to something else. Because faith is a power in its own right. And if Jesus is to be all the world to you, then you'd better keep that avenue of faith wide open and recognize that you can depend upon him even whenever you listen to the 5 o'clock news and it seems like he's losing. But he's not losing any more than he lost when he died on the cross. It seems like the devil is winning, but it looked like that when Jesus Christ hung suspended between heaven and earth. And Paul said he triumphed over them by the cross. If he is to triumph in your life, it will not be because your religion is correct or we do all the right things in the building. It will be because your heart has opened the avenue of faith to God through which all of his blessings imitate him in your sin. When we get to the place where faith means that to us, then we will be people who can make his story our story, and it ought not to stop there. We ought to then begin to make that story other people's story as well. That's when we become witnesses for him. Your life affects the lives of those around you, for good or ill. When I was a youngster, I went to high school in Nashville, Tennessee. I was the drum major of the band, first drum major they ever had. You know. Oh, I was resplendent. <laughs> I had a vest with brass buttons on it, a bearskin hat, an ostrich feather. I was eight and a half feet tall when I got all that on. <laughs> we had from the seventh grade through the twelfth in that high school. And I remember one day, every, every afternoon, in the last period of the day, I practiced the band out in the park across the street from the high school. The windows, we had windows in those days instead of air conditioning. The band practicing. And one day I forgot my baton and left it inside and there was a high wall around the school building and I went running back inside, ran around. As I started around in front of me, I almost ran over him. He must have been a seventh grader. He was way down young. I'm trying not to fall on him, which wouldn't have hurt him very much. He started at the bottom and he looked all the way up like this. <laughs> he said, gee, I wish I was you. All the classes that I had in high school, all the teaching that I had, did not teach me as much as that one moment. As soon as I walked home from school, I noticed for the first time that there were little kids in their front yard with broomsticks pretending to be drum majors. And I realized I was the only drum major in that part of town. They were imitating me. And it really tore me up. And I wondered how many times as I had walked backwards along a street downtown in a parade leading the band, wisecracking with the trombone section in the front as drum majors always do, I wondered how many times I had said something good that some little kid looking between his father's legs or from his father's shoulders might have heard and been affected by because it was said by the drum major of the band and it changed my whole life. Whatever story was mine was being told that I did not see. People whose faces I did not recognize, whose names I would never know. That's the way we are. One of the great rewarding privileges of having preached for 104 years like I have <laughs> is that every once in a while somebody comes along like Bill and says I heard a sermon and it affected my life somewhere in the past 
people that I did not see in the audience, that I did not know was there, were there. Let me tell you something. Every one of you is like that. There are people around you, not just your grandchildren, but maybe the clerk at the grocery store, the people that you deal with every day. If his story is really your story, it can become their story too. Through your life. You need to be very, very careful who does your interpreting for you. Don't let it be the rock stars of today. How many of you young men here would like for your wife to be like Madonna? <laughs> How many of you would like to pattern your life after many of the athletic heroes that we have today that are constantly picked up for drugs or sex offenses or DWI or something else? Who does your interpreting for you? Who interprets life? Who tells you what's valuable? Who do you imitate? Whose story are you passing on to your friends and those around you? Your peers are not worthy to interpret life for you. They're as confused as you are. There is only one source to which you can turn. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, said Jesus Christ. But the only way to find him is not in the words of a sermon, not in a Sunday school class, as good as they may be, not even in the words of your parents, as wonderful as they might be. The only way to find him is in your personal faith in him. And when he begins to live in your life, when his will begins to be in your heart and written in your mind, to the point where that tube of faith is so open that his flowing into your life changes it into what he wants it to be and you become intuitively a child of God. Then you will make this world a place of joy and peace for that's what his story does. And you will pass on in the midst of all the despair of this terrible place a kind of hope and joy and light that earth does not afford from any other source. And glorious is the quest. We invite you to stand and sing. Jesus.